Welcome to Lady Geek Live with me, Meredith Loughran. My special guest today is professional illustrator and full-time artist in the gaming, comics, pinup, and entertainment industries for nearly 30 years. Please welcome Monty Michael Moore. So I was reading up on you a little bit, 30, almost 30 years in the industry. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, with Geek Insider, what I love to do is talk about getting inside the geek. Where did you start? What was the motivation? Um, you know, like, how did you get your start? Let, let's start with your Genesis story a little bit. Okay. Um, well, my, my geekdom's pretty deep as far as uh, gaming. I, I, I uh, started, I was big D and D player uh, all through the eighties. And, um, uh, eventually I got to work on Dungeons and Dragons when they brought it back in 1998. But um, it was an interesting thing that happened. I was in art school at Colorado State University, and it just so happened that I went to a comic book shop uh, my senior year, and I frequented it pretty often uh, to get inspiration for art and buy books and things like that. And the manager of the store, uh, Fusion Comics, was a, a, a volunteering to be an editor on an indie self-published book that these two guys were doing that he knew. I kind of forgot how they met. And uh, he said, well, you know, you airbrush, don't you? Because we would always talk about art. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm editing this book and it's going to be called Lords of Light. And uh, these two brothers are publishing it, Gabe and Chachi Hernandez, not the same Hernandez brothers as Love and Rockets, different Hernandez brothers. And uh, he said, you know, we need somebody to paint the cover, to airbrush, to color it. And so, so I met with them and was essentially hired. I wasn't kind of part of the team yet. I was more of a hired guy, even though I was still in college, so were they. And then we all became friends. We started meeting on a more regular basis. and. They said, well, we're going to go to this comic book convention that's in San Diego called Comic Con. And this was 1993, 90, well, 92 when we started. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, uh, so I airbrushed the cover of the book. And we actually, before it came out, we had to change the title because they found out or got contacted by somebody after it was solicited in Diamond that there had been a book written by Harlan Ellison, I think, in the 60s called The Lord of the Light. And so we were forced to chase, change our name. And so the name of the book just came out as Lords, and we only ever did one issue. Mm -hmm. And then I became friends and part of the team. So I uh, colored the entire book, but I actually airbrushed every single page and every single panel of lords i think i should actually have one of those handy so i could show people what the the early work looked like back then so that's um, always so fun to do right yeah into comics was indie comics self-published uh they much like eastman and laird they borrowed the money from their parents to produce the first book and we all road tripped out to san diego with five thousand copies in the back of a van <laughs> uh you know to sell this book that we did and I think we still ended up selling like a thousand copies while we were out there, which is pretty great. Now at the time, San Diego only had uh, about 30,000 was what the attendance was. And uh, so we kind of got the bug. And even though we came up against a, a number of pitfalls and headaches that befall most indie publishers, and obviously this is in the infancy of the internet. So there was no online sales or promotion. You didn't, get in front of fans unless you were at a store signing or at a convention. Mm -hmm. And we did a number of local store signings, Mile High Comics, Fusion, a bunch of anybody who would have us. So uh, we, you know, we didn't make money. We, we sold some books. I, I think we recouped the, probably the investment capital of it, but I still have two cases in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> Those are probably and, worth something. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably put them back on my website now that the career's gone pretty well. Um, so that was the kind of Genesis story. And 
I was working as a full-time graphic designer and doing illustration on the side. And I decided that maybe it was better to try to freelance and work with other people on their books rather than trying to do our own thing. So I think my first freelance cover was for Helena, which was by an indie small company called Lightning Comics. And I did a few covers for them. And then that later on led to, you know, Vampirella and some work for Chaos and, you know, pretty much anybody and anybody who would hire you. And I was kind of trying to make my way as an illustrator and, and cover artist and painter. Uh, I thought about going the route of a colorist, um, but once computers came along and that was the new look, I started to teach myself to do it, but it wasn't what I really enjoyed doing. So I didn't pursue it and actually turned down a couple of gigs to computer color books so that I could pursue traditional art. Okay, so I have a question, uh, kind of piggybacking on what you just said. Um, I know that graphic arts and computer animation and coloring and everything, that, that is huge. That's the technology that it is. Do you think that there would be a renaissance of, of the old school coloring? Or do you think that that's gone? Because people love retro. Yeah, it's true. It's a good question. I'd like to see more of it come back, but you know, I don't know that you would see a full renaissance. And I think that the, the expense, if somebody came to me and said, you know, we want an Alex Ross quality book that is fully painted like Marvel's or Kingdom Come was, uh, it would be a, a very serious investment because rather than saying, hey, we're producing this comic book for in general, a few hundred dollars a page, depending on how many artists are involved, you know, you might be talking about thousands per page because of the length of time that it can take to truly fully paint a book. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I have, one of the things that I've seen is that there's fewer and fewer people like me who can draw and paint and do a lot of traditional art. So when it comes to um, different skill sets in the comic book industry, you're, you're finding that the collectors really gravitate and support those artists who have the traditional skills because they want to collect sketches and sketch covers the last five or 10 years have become super popular. So when it comes to commissions and things like that, um, I think that it's great. I'm going to move my chair here. Um, mm -hmm. It's great for what, what happened? The computer went to sleep um, for that aspect. But I was kind of thinking about it as I'm working on Loco Hero, I'm, I'm painting two of the covers for the book, one by Eric Basildura, E. Bass, and one by Mal Mike DeBalfo. And in the sense, I'm still using a lot of the same approach that a digital colorist might take, but it's gonna take me two, three times, four times as long. I think a lot of colorists can, you know, color a whole cover in half a day to a day, probably digitally very fast. And, you know, these covers will take me two, three, four days just to do the painted aspect of it. But when I'm done, I'll have a physical cover that I can sell to a collector. And that's what the, the digital, what we miss out on, on mm -hmm. digital. And I've done a couple of pretty high fo profile projects that were digital. And at the end of it, I just, I kind of wished I'd had a painting. And so I did 10 paintings for, they weren't paintings, 10 images. I don't call them paintings. 10 images for Sony, uh, for, there was a game called The Legends of Norath, which was EverQuest 2. And I also did 10 pieces for Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And the Star Wars, when I did the 10 pieces for Star Wars, they allowed me to paint them. But when I did, they said, you know, your art doesn't look like everybody else's. It's all digital. We need you to look like everybody else, as opposed uh, to individual. And that's so almost they, like saying, let's dumb you down a little bit. Oh. Well, it's a, I don't know what the right word is, but they wanted it to be, you know, homogenous, all the art and that sort of thing, as opposed to, hey, look at all the fresh individual styles. And so um, I did the 10 pieces for them. And then I never did another project because I said, this isn't fulfilling to me. And when I did the Star Wars piece, the very first painting that I sold, which was a Princess Leia, went to Rancho Obi-Wan in California to 
basically the Star Wars Museum. So I have a piece of art now, at least the museum can say, the only traditional art that was done for this whole project, which came from Monty Moore, they can have a piece in there because there's wow. no other pieces from the game. I was the only one working traditional. Wow, that's so cool. So yeah. you are actually, uh, at this moment, you are on the Loco on the Loose circuit. <laughs> yeah, like a virtual <laughs> tour. Your book. And I'm going to, I'm just going to pop this up here real quick on the screen so that everybody can see Loco Hero. Uh, no. Reality is overrated. And I just, I love the story behind her. Uh, it is Brina Hernandez, correct? Correct. Yep. So tell, tell us, what was the uh, what was the motivation behind her character? Like, how how did she pop into your head? You know, was it a dream? Was it uh, an experience? Where where did Brina Hernandez come from? It's a pretty interesting story because it was an experience and it happened at Comic Con of all places, San Diego. So 2014, it's a it's at night on Saturday night when the um, uh, what do you call it? The cosplay contest, the costume contest is going on. And I'm coming back to my car from uh, uh, being out and having some dinners with industry people. And I'd, I'd had a, a, a meeting with some movie folks earlier in the day that are friends of mine and we've worked on projects together. And I said, if you were going to do your own project that was a film or a comic or a series, you know, would you do horror? What would you do? And he said, well, you know, I think superhero is still going to be popular for a while. But it's, you know, if you're thinking in terms of movies or uh, TV series, that can be very expensive. If you look at, you know, X-Men and budgets and special effects. But if you look at something like Kick-Ass, which is also from a comic book, there's not, you know, superpowers and people flying around and everything because it's more grounded in our real world. And so my brain was kind of trying to go, how do I do a grounded superhero story that isn't about people flying around? you know, Superman and things. And I'm walking down the the uh, sidewalk in front of the convention center, coming right towards me. It's about five or six people in costume, cosplay, fully dressed as superheroes. And at the same time that we pass each other, I'm also passed by a woman on the right who's in the street and she's pushing her cart. She's clearly homeless and she was very much struggling with reality. She was having an argument with herself very loud and was losing. And so I was literally struck at almost like, you know, that lightning idea that said, well, what if I had a superhero who lives on the street and is homeless, but she thinks she's a superhero. And so these two worlds, right as I'm walking by, melded. And I said, you know, but she doesn't have power. She only thinks she's a superhero. And uh, in in the series Kick-Ass, the, the main character, you know, he's kind of a nerd. He's a dork. And I said, well, I want my character to be strong and, you know, beautiful. Because, one, that's going to resonate with the, the buying crowd of entertainment and things like that. But it's not to also say that living on the street and things like that, you actually can't be beautiful and strong and still be sexy or in your own way, even if you're eating out of a garbage can. And there is a scene in the comic where she eats out of a garbage can. Uh, and so uh, I started taking notes on the story, literally on the drive back from San Diego. And I was going to ask you that. Yeah, I was yeah. going to ask because sometimes when that hits you, if you don't write it down, it's gone. So I'm so glad that you did. But uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so on the I, one of the things that I love about road trips is is that a lot of my stories and almost entire screenplays have come on these like eighteen hour drives, and we'll take copious notes. And whoever's driving, you'll switch off and you bounce ideas off each other. So I had my buddy Wayne who was out there helping me that year. He was driving, and I was taking notes. And he's a comic book guy, right? So we're talking comics. He's very well read, and this story was sort of roughly born from that. And I said, well, how do I make her as a female character also strong and capable? And so I decided that um, she was going to uh, have been a martial arts uh, when she was younger. And then on top of that, when she goes into the military, she also gets military training. And uh, my family is very patriotic. We've had military service in our family all the way back to George Washington's armies. 
and I have a plaque here on the wall in our house that the original was actually signed by Washington. It says this person in this army served, uh, and uh, my uh, three of my cousins served, and my grandfather was. Uh, this is a picture of my. What I just printed. So there's a, a portrait that I did of my grandfather when he was in the Navy, and he retired as an admiral. And so we uh, we have a lot of military service, and so I thought, you know, this is a chance for me to combine a couple of things. One, I like originality, so I'd never seen a story where the main character of the setting was the streets, homelessness, and, and Denver and every major city has problems with that, um, where we're not able to service those who, who really need help. And a lot of those people end up having come from military background, our service veterans who suffer from PTSD, who feel disconnected from their family. And I do some volunteering and things like that with the VF post, uh, VFW post number one here in Denver, which is the Veterans of Foreign Wars. And so it really kind of all started gelling and coming together about, well, who is this character? And so I started coming up with ideas for her background to say she's strong and she's capable so that when she does get con confronted physically on the streets, you know, she kicks some butt. I want a strong character. And in, in writing the story of her journey, that will also be one of her downfalls is, is that um, uh, she, like a lot of people, we don't learn to rely on other people. And so in the beginning, she tries to take on too much. And it's not till the end of the story arc that she's going to have to come to terms with. If she doesn't get people to help her, there's no way she's going to be able to accomplish her goals. So, you know, that's her that's going to need to grow as a character as well. So in writing, I've, I've written, uh, I think, 11 or 12 screenplays that, uh, you know, you're trying to have your character have their strong points, but also their weaknesses. And, and how do you make them um, the kind of character that people connect with? Uh, because this character in general is disconnected from her family. And then after she takes a a head trauma and she gets a dissociative disorder with reality, then she's really disconnected. One of the things that I really love about this book, and I think it's with a lot of comic book creators uh, or and uh, just people who are generally um, content creators, period, um, is that there's uh, there's we can do social awareness in really interesting ways. And so, you know, your character, she's Latina. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see that very often. Um, you know, I she, that was missing. So it was yeah. a perfect opportunity. So, I mean, that was, that was just like, wow, that, that blow, blew me away. Um, being a, a war vet, a female, a strong character, um, and in a way broken. And it's just so many things that that is that makes this book so powerful, in my opinion, because it does uh, it does speak to the social awareness, what's out there, the ugliness that's out there, but as you said earlier, the beauty that's uh, underneath it all, if you care to look, mm -hmm. and um, you know that that's. Do you ever feel that responsibility, like okay, I'm creating something to help? Uh, raise awareness or um, do, you know, be part of the greater good. We'll be back right after this. Check it out. MobileEdge.com has award-winning products with innovative features and edgy contemporary designs that empower you to look sharp and travel smart with your mobile tech. Your beloved, not to mention expensive gaming gear and mobile tech devices are an extension of you, so give them the protection and style they deserve wherever you go. Find them at mobileedge.com and protect your tech with Mobile Edge. Bring it on. Do you ever feel that responsibility like, okay, I'm creating something to help uh, raise awareness or... Um, do you know be part of the greater good it it for me it happened very naturally and i think that that's why every all these pieces have come together because i think on one hand what you might see a lot of times if somebody says i would like to create a book for this awareness or agenda or story 
And mine actually didn't happen that way. I started with a character who I just said, I don't know who she is. She lives on the streets. She, you know, doesn't own things. And she thinks she's a superhero. So she's going to go do the right things for the right reasons, but the reasons are actually wrong in her brain. And so the dissociative part uh, that's more clever and the entertaining is, is that in the story, she thinks that the big bad guy, rather than him being a real estate developer who's trying to sort of push out the slums and scrape all the, the, the people who live there and are in the shelter, he wants to develop it into a mall, but she thinks he wants to develop it into a supervillain headquarters. So that makes it, you know, entertaining, but I think that the awareness part of it has weaved its way into the story in a natural way. So I'm not beating people over the head with it. And uh, even when uh, the, when I was talking with, uh, Kevin and Rob at NSC TV and in the advocate when we were doing CyberCon and we were talking about the project, I said, you know, I've wor been working on this since 2014 and I'm not sure if now's the right time to launch this campaign given the pandemic and everything. And they said, no, no, go for it and all this. So once I sort of had to pour the gas on the fire and really develop this, I hadn't really thought about the specific outreach for the veterans part. I thought, well, maybe I can do something with a portion of the proceeds uh, for the local VFW. But once the campaign was nearing launch and things were really coming together, we decided to look and say, well, how can we do a greater good? What if we had a whole version of the book? And we called that one the honor bound cover. And I had done a very specific piece uh, that is for sort of PS, uh, PTSD awareness. I actually think I have a graphic for that. Let me uh, let me pop that in here. Okay, there it is. And so I did a drawing and then I did a little computer graphics overlay with the flag and then I laid in pages from the book and specific panels that tie back into some of the events that happened to her in the story. And I decided to donate all of the proceeds from this particular book and right now it's our number one selling tier, I shouldn't say sell, but uh, the rewards tier on Kickstarter. This is the one that people are supporting the most or they're saying, hey, here's the one I'm going to collect, but I also want to support what Monty's doing. So I'll get one of those books as well. And uh, so we reached out to Operation Second Chance, which works with military veterans at Walter Reed Hospital, which is the military hospital in Washington, D.C., and works with them when they're struggling with emotional, physical, and mental issues from their, you know, time in the service and combat and gives them a better chance to integrate back into uh, civilian life after serving in Afghanistan or uh, Kuwait or, you know, anywhere, any of the troubles that they have. And so um, we did some research online to, uh, for an organization that has, where a very high percentage of the money, 80, 90% goes directly to um, families and moving people back and forth and getting them to their uh, appointments, making sure they, what, everything they have. And for me personally, I think that rather than just trying to help one or two individual people on the street, you can say, this is my particular cause. Um, I think you, that there's just a greater reach through an organization like that who is, you know, that has some oversight into way, you know, things are handled. And then um, uh, there, uh, one of the ideas that we're talking about for the second issue is that if this goes well, because it's not the full story arc, although this is a 48 page story, I'd like to do three, three, three issues of this first arc that would wrap up what my initial screenplay was. And I'd like the second issue possibly to go directly possibly for homeless and, and feeding homeless and advocacy for that, because that's the other part of who she is and her background. But there's another part about where she lives. And most of the people that she interacts with in the book that aren't sort of the bad guys are the people who live on the street and work in the shelter. Uh, there's a, a young boy who's reading comic books along with some of her exploits. And so I actually tie in the world of comics to this world that she's living in because when she thinks she's a superhero, she says, well, I think I know how superheroes dress. They wear, 
you know, uh, tight spandex so they can move and they wear goggles and she has ski goggles on her head, but in her brain, she thinks that they're night vision goggles mm -hmm. and that rollerblade, you know, elbow pads are like what Batman would wear. And so it, it's a different reality of how she looks to how um, she appears maybe in her brain. And when she goes into fight or flight mode, that's kind of when the, the, um, the disassociative part really kicks in. And so when her brain says that guy's a bad guy and he's beating somebody up, in her brain it might appear as a ninja. So in the comic, we draw it as a ninja. And if she says, well, if that guy's a ninja, then I must be a samurai or a ronin. And so the, the, the imagery changes in the book and you might even just be transported to visually to a different place, even though you come to understand that that's not really how they look because reality kind of switches back and forth. Yeah, and it's pretty amazing that uh, you were able to do that so well, because a lot of times when people see that and they see all of these different scenes, they're like, how is this connected? Right. But we know by knowing her backstory and going, okay, you're, you're kind of along this crazy ride with her and mm -hmm. these adventures and things like that. Um, you know, <laughs> I have to say, okay, support Loco Hero Kickstarter. I created a little bit.ly because it makes it a lot easier than a really super long URL. <laughs> it's bit.ly uh, hash MMM Loco Hero. So I really would recommend everybody to take a peek at it, uh, you know, throw some support behind it, read through the bio, read through the story, and, uh, you know, throw throw uh, some support his way. If you can't share it, um, you know, because the more people who see it, the the more eyes on the story. And it's really, it, it is just a stunning story uh, i mean just i love i'm a storyteller and i tell people all the time i am not i'm not really into comics um i'm just starting to get into it and it's one of those things that we're going to be launching a new series called the comic noob oh, i'm right. the noob right. Perfect. <laughs> and uh you know i mean we're basically taking p people it's not even 101 it's like zero to let's create a superhero type of thing um but away from me let Let's talk a little bit more about you. Um, let me see here. Uh, we've got a message here from Terry McIver. Congrats on the Kickstarter for Loco Hero. It's uh, it went fast, fantastically well, and you still have time on it. Yeah, we actually um, just uh, crested the first week, so we have just a little under three full weeks left. So we're yeah. we're doing great. Um, but now that a lot of my fans have already supported, it's the next level of art outreach. We have to get you know out to the general. Um, comic supportive part to really get to those upper tiers. Yeah, I'm looking at your uh, Kickstarter page right now. You've got 387 backers. I would love to see that at 500 backers. Yeah, and that's, that's 19 that's days kind of ago. I'd, I'd love to be in there. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically, I had two questions that I had written down because normally, you know, I have organic conversations and you answered them already. So oh. you're like the best guest ever. <laughs> I wanted to ask about the, you know, the uh, veterans at, and your connection to them. And then I wanted to ask about, uh, you know, the special cover and, uh, you know, going to Operation Second Chance. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really cool. Um, now, so I had a question here based on what you said. You said that you were writing screenplays, that you've mm -hmm. written screenplays. Do you foresee Local Hero maybe becoming something on the small or the big screen? Is that is that yep. something that you strive to do? Yeah, so that was, um, believe it or not, the, that's my end goal. And, and it's not necessarily just a financial one. I think it, the, the story is something that content creators, whether it's a Netflix or an Amazon, I mean, there's all these great stories out there and people love fantastical kind of stories. But what if you had a story like this that was still brought in those aspects of pop culture, but was a, a little more grounded and had a subtle uh, uh, awareness message that was going through it about some of the cultural struggles that part of our uh, population faces. And I think it would resonate with a lot of people. So believe it or not, the first thing that I wrote for Loco Hero was a pilot episode, an entire pilot episode. And that's actually what became exactly the first 48 page book. So 
a pilot episode is roughly around 60 pages of, of actual you know, dialogue and what's happening, as opposed to 110, 120 for a feature film. And so what I had done when I was first breaking down the story was, uh, what's my first overall arc that she's going to go through and the bad guys and all that. And so I broke it down more into what would be a season of a series, you know, anywhere from maybe eight to 12 episodes, something like that. And then I carved out the chunk that would be a comic book. And then I sort of expanded a little and said, okay, make it a graphic novel. So it could be 48 pages because 22 is just kind of not enough to tell what I wanted to tell as far as the story. And so uh, I, once the, the Kickstarter and the first, uh, you know, book or two are out there, I'm going to be honestly actively marketing it for, um, for a, t a television series. That would be my, end goal for the character and the awareness. So uh, once I was already writing it, I thought with Kickstarter doing as well it is, as it is it, and grown over the last five years, this is the perfect platform for me to get it out there, still maintain all my owner's rights and a clear, what we call chain of title. And then through either my own marketing efforts or being at conventions or connections, the goal is to try to say, hey, aren't you interested in this property? Read this comic book and it's your, it's your pilot episode. And if somebody were to read it and go, oh my gosh, I, you know, I love the visuals and the story and the fact that she's a strong female character, uh, needs to learn to you know, lean on other people, but she's totally capable. But in other ways, she's, she's broken, she's disconnected, and you have to find a way for her to have this ups and downs of storytelling to make her a compelling character and not just, you know, beauty is skin deep kind of a thing. Like she's beautiful on the outside, but you know, inside uh, we're all, you know, sort of different people than we are on the shell, uh, both good and bad. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that um, draws me to characters or a story or um, a TV show or a comic book is um, is that story arc and the ability to uh, hit me in the feels. You know, I want to laugh out loud. I want to cry. And I mean, and and I say if uh, if there's anything out there, whether I'm reading it or watching it, if it makes me cry, I'm like that. That's on my list to uh, look for th this creator and follow them everywhere. And not in the creepy stalker way, but I'm like, no. what? man, that's so good. I connected with it. I want more. And so we seek out those stories. Um, you know, I mean, this has been so well received so far based on your Kickstarter. And I really hope that somebody will pick it up and, and run with this. I have to ask, do you have a an actress in mind to play her? Uh... I guess not too specifically. I mean, she would, uh, you know, be a Mich Michelle Rodriguez type, right? And Michelle's obviously played some strong type of characters um, uh, in films, both military and others. So, you know, I would want her to be somebody who is tough and strong and has like a street sense about them. Uh, and in episode two, we kind of learn more about why she went into the military and maybe not college, what happened to her father, who is an immigrant, uh, who had his own business and what happened, why he's not in the picture now. So um, we're already working on parts for the, the the second part of the story. And I've already reached out to to my art team of uh, Sean Callahan and, and uh, Donnie Hadawaha over in uh, Indonesia and said, you know, hey, are you available and interested? Do you want to keep doing this? And they both said, we love it, you know, we're ready to start. And um, one of the things that I like about this project too, that even though I'm a full-time artist, I know that my strengths aren't necessarily as a visual storyteller, meaning sequential art, because I'm, I'm kind of a slow artist. I like to do one piece that has 30 or 40 hours into it, instead of five comics pages that have five hours into it. Hey, Phil, thanks for joining. Um, and so, um, I have basically since 2014 been able to take projects that I'm doing in the comics industry for IDW, Image, Marvel, DC, uh, Lady Death, Coffin Comics, use those funds to pay other artists. 
So I've hired letterers and my colorist and uh, my artist inker and uh, you know editors and things like that. And I'm keeping that money in the industry. So as an artist, I'm helping support them. And now I'm bringing it to Kickstarter. I'm asking people, hey, help me continue to support them and get my dream out there because I've actually carried it this far to the finish line. But due to the pandemic and, and things like that, you know, happening when it did, I kind of set the ball down on the one yard line and was like, I don't think now's the right time to try to score. And it was, you know, uh, Kevin and Rob at NSC who said, no, no, we're, the whole team's behind you at NSC, uh, yourself included. We're going to help you carry it in because this kind of thing is all about outreach. And even though I have done Kickstarters before, they were for art books. And so there's some new things that have to do with comics and, and marketing and getting it out there on the indie side of things that honestly I'm not as familiar with because I'm usually just the hired hand guy in the back room who's doing covers for everyone else. It kind of feels like I've been at everybody else's party and I never invited anybody to my house for a party. <laughs> you never go to a party with empty hands, all right? You, you walk in with your elbows first because you're carrying stuff. That's, that's, <laughs> that's right. what I was always told. Phil Lockler says, loving what I'm seeing so far from Local Hero. Cannot wait to get my copies and neither can I. Terry McIver uh, pops in here, says absolutely NSC is going international yes they are and it's really exciting to see and um uh let me just pop your uh bitly link in here that we created for you so anybody who's not familiar with the kickstarter be, be sure to hit that link um you know and read through it because it's just it's really interesting with the story you get to uh, learn a little bit more about monty and his journey uh the character uh brina hernandez where she came from so that kind of segues into what i wanted to ask you about the variant covers you have several artists who've come forward and um created a, a cover for you. Mm -hmm. What was that like, first of all, as the creator of, of this character to say, all right, I'm, I'm giving you a chance with my baby here. That's, that's <laughs> kind of that how like? it felt. Um, it's interesting because some of the, a couple of the folks like Marat Michaels, who has been in the industry as long as I have, even a little longer, I have done covers for his campaigns and his stories for several years. And so uh, there are uh, a number of us who just kind of, as an artist favor and friends, we just sort of trade. Like you do a cover for me, I'll do a cover for you. Or, hey, I'm going to bank that. And when I have my Kickstarter next year, please do one for me. And there's a couple of great things that happen there. One, you, you get to sort of bring the community together. And if I have a Mike DeBalfo cover, Ryan Kincaid, Jesse Wichman, uh, all these kind of great artists, I'm able to bring some of their fans to my campaign because some of them might not be as fans of my artwork, but they will, well, I collect DeBalfo or eBass. And so it's a marketing thing that obviously I'm learning from them and they've had very successful Kickstarters. And one of my uh, uh, mentors for many years is Brian Polito at Coffin Comics with Lady Death, who has literally sort of brought her back from oblivion to uh, kind of being the king of Kickstarter. You know, he does many Kickstarters per year. They raise over $300,000. He maintains the direction of the ship, the what his characters, who he's hiring, when things come out, and he is a master of marketing. And so uh, I do a lot of covers for them, and so I try to look and see what, what Brian does and how I can make it my own. You don't want to copycat someone, um, but you try to find a balance between covers that are maybe uh, provocative and sexy, some that are more storytelling oriented. But when it came to these series of uh, four or five covers that I've gotten from these artists, uh, I really didn't give them any direction, which I think being a fellow artist, I basically said, here's my character, here's her full story, here's the artwork from the inside, and here's the drawings of what she looks like. What would you like to do? And so every one of them was very different we have the Marat Michaels one where it's split right down the middle and it looks like night and day, but really it's her real world versus her reality of how she sees it. So it's a perfectly descriptive of the actual world that she's in. She's really in an alley in her outfit and she's facing a thug, but she thinks she's facing a, 
demonic hawk masked guy with a spear and she's dressed like a gladiator and uh jesse witchman's she's facing herself in a broken mirror which indicates sort of a broken character or psyche and then the reflection of the character is the superhero part that's you know trying to emerge but it's also kind of different because in the mirror she's kind of got her her hand up to her face like Shh, it's a secret and so you just have these really different covers um the mike chrome cover where she's sitting at the bottom and she's in her street clothes very simple very um uh innocent and she's got her just army jacket on street clothes and then this larger than life version of her standing behind in her full outfit has this heroic you know like i'm gonna you know sort of stand for those who can't and so to me that that cover really speaks to me as well so i've used that imagery for my banner and a lot of the promo images that you see for the Kickstarter because when I saw that piece it just resonated with me and I said that that even more than my own art I'm going to use here I'm going to use another artist's art for my own Kickstarter rather than saying hey look at my art and um, because I think it was a it was appropriate. Yeah, and for anybody who uh, doesn't know what he's talking about, on the replay, we'll probably superimpose that on the videos. But in the meantime, check out his Kickstarter, and you can scroll down, and you can see all of these different variant covers. Uh, I mean, they're just stunning. I, I don't, I don't think I have a favorite except for the one that uh, that was the special that you put together here for uh, Operation Bear. Second Chance. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just, I love this this cover so much. I, uh, I want that as a poster hanging up on my wall. Uh, um, we can make that happen. Oh, right. That's what I want to hear because I am, uh, I am an army brat. I am married oh. to uh, a, an air force veteran and I've got two boys in the Marine Corps. Oorah. So Oorah. I'm giving a shout, shout out to them. So, and I actually wanted to point out to my son, Jeremy, he is not feeling well. So I just wanted to give him a little shout out and uh, let him know that I am thinking of you as we are talking about local hero here uh i've got another one who's stationed who is actually stuck in spain <laughs> because oh. of covid but um yeah so i want to give them a little shout out while uh while i was thinking about it well i um, had uh, no. three three cousins yeah. that all served and fortunately they are all retired and they got out with all their fingers and toes and they were in uh, navy marine corps and army Mm -hmm. And Phil Lockler asks, what made you decide to tackle such a tough issue in PTSD for your first comic? I don't think this is your first comic. Um, it's the first one that I've fully written and published as a comic. So there was one story that was a one shot called Bloodlines from 10, 20 years ago that I did. Um, but I actually did more of the art and I didn't fully write it. It was written by a friend of mine, Steve Oatney. Um, but uh, to answer Phil's question, I, again, I didn't set out to tackle anything. It was really just the pieces kept falling together. And with the initial idea of this character who was struggling with her own reality that she thought she was a superhero, it seemed more natural to say, well, what caused that? You know, is it a combination of both the PTSD and flashbacks and dealing with survivor's guilt is, is one of the things that she's dealing with because of what you learn, what happens to her squad uh, when she was in Afghanistan. Um, but then once she sort of has the head trauma, it kind of fractures her reality even more. And, and so um, then reality sort of goes upside down, but emerging from that really is this hero who says, I'm gonna go out and stop injustice because that's what heroes do. And somewhere deep inside why she signed up for the army she knew that she was capable of heroic things and she has that inside her like i think a lot of our military uh, any military from around the world not just us that say i am when there is a need for people to either stop tyranny or help people in a flood or during a covid panic or you know people step up and they have that that service within them. And so that's you know what this character has. And so that becomes the impetus for her to say, 
I, I want to serve others like I serve my country and how can I serve the people that she loves that live on the streets with her, her little community. She's kind of the only one because they can't really do it themselves because they just, you know, it, it's hard to do that. You know, mm -hmm. are you going to, are you going to, you know, take a bullet for somebody? And if you have that within you, then you already have what it takes to be a hero. Yep. So now I'm a storyteller and I love a good story arc. And I see this story kind of ending in one of two ways. And you don't have to tell anybody, <laughs> uh, but it could be really tragic or it could be healing. And I'm kind of torn with how I want to see it because, you know, when, when I see tragic again, it hits the feels and I just, you know, it's like, ah, um, but at the same time, it's like that, that's what, um, makes them so important, you know, when you connect with a character uh -huh. and then at the same time, you want to see her heal from the head trauma and get over the PTSD and things like that. And again, you know, I'm just putting that out there that I, I see one of two pathways for, uh, for well, Brina Hernandez. The, the good news is in, in storytelling, you don't have to have one without the other. So I can say that the direction that the story is heading, there is both serious tragedy and there is also some healing along the way. And so, mm -hmm. it, you know, you can have various degrees of everything and maybe you're still in a better place at the end of it, or maybe the scales have shifted. And depending on, on how Loco Hero goes and how it's received, I'll be able to tell um, more stories with her. And then I also have, uh, just as kind of a separate thing, because this is going so well, I'm actually revisiting another story of mine, which is called Blood and Bullets. And it has, there's a Facebook page for it. And I was asked many years ago to do a screenplay for very powerful female characters. And I had written a screenplay that this company wanted to option. It was called Dead by Sundown. And most of the characters were male and it's a supernatural Western. So if you kind of think like Kate Beckinsale, Underworld, put it in the old West, that's kind of the setting for Blood and Bullets. And so they said, well, we like this story, but the woman uh, who was going to option it was um, uh, wanted female characters that were very strong. And so in Blood and Bullets, uh, the main character, as well as the antagonists, are actually predominantly female. And so I'm going to revive that project, which already has about that first half of the first issue already done. So I've already reached out to my artists and said, let's bring this back on track and let's get it moving forward to, um, to also bring that story to uh, Kickstarter or the film or what. So if you go to Blood and Bullets comic, uh, or you look at other pages that I manage, you'll see the other other stories. And I started that one even before Loco Hero. And I was so passionate about Loco Hero that I kind of moved it to the forefront and it became the number one kind of focus. And so unfortunately, Blood and Bullets has languished a little bit. Um, but as a screenplay, it's been optioned three times. Um, wow. But the, um, the options have lapsed. They didn't put it into production. So I have the full rights back to it. And so I'm actually bringing that project um, back as well. And we've got a uh, comment here from my friend, Frank Cazada. Can't wait to get the honor bound variant. Just made my thank pledge. Thanks for getting me excited about Loco on the Loose. <laughs> well, thank you, Frank. That's very appreciative. And the, yeah. thank you for supporting veterans. Yeah, he's actually a veteran himself, and he goes through PTSD. And this uh, this story will definitely resonate with him, as it will with so many other people that I know uh, who are in the service or who've just been through trauma. Mm -hmm. um, you yes. know, so I think it's a it's a very important story. Um, diverting a little bit away from Loco Hero, um, can you tell us a little bit about Monster Book Club? Uh, the Monster Book Club is basically a pledge to get uh, a collection of my art books that are still available. And so uh, uh, I, one of the things that was nice to see was some people had pledged that tears. Now, because I've been in the industry for so long, there's a lot of people who say, oh, I have this one and I have that one. But because there's new fans every day, I mean, I get friend requests even on Facebook, sometimes two a day, sometimes 10. And so if people aren't familiar with my art, it's a way, thank you, Frank, obviously, uh, for 
his service as well. Uh, Phil said, thank you. That um, uh, a, a number of the books that are art books of mine from earlier in my career are sold out, the first three. But because I still have copies of uh, Majestica and Mischief, my cover-up book, which covers my whole career, that was a Kickstarter book. Um, we, we decided to put a little, you know, sort of package out there that said, hey, if you want to get caught up on all the books that I'm able to sell you, here you can get a really nice selection of art books all at once at a discount. And I sign each one of them. And sometimes I put extra free prints and things like that in there. And those, all the artwork that's in those art books covers comics, games, movies, a lot of pinup art, a lot of really strong female characters. Uh, and, and some of it covers my whole career and some of it goes all the way back to the nineties. NSCLiveTV.com is the premier site for comic book sellers to expand their viewership and have their live reply or bin auction showcased while helping viewers find good quality comic book auctions or pop culture content with the ease of simply flipping a channel. They feature artists, writers, news, interviews, reviews, podcasts, cosplayers, and more. Tune in today with NSC and you can enjoy the ease of viewing content without having to search through endless pages. Tune in today. That's NSCLiveTV.com. All the artwork that's in those art books covers comics, games, movies, a lot of pinup art, a lot of really strong female characters, uh, and, and some of it covers my whole career, and some of it goes all the way back to the 90s. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as investment in time, when you think of a character, basically like you did for, for the Brina character, mm -hmm. you're investing uh, time to develop her backstory, do the initial drawings, um, get her story arc together. How much of an investment in time do, would you say that you average for your books and for these characters, um, or is it different for all of them? Mm, I'm When I'm writing, because I love writing, if I couldn't do art, I know I would be writing. Um, oh, so there, Phil says he doesn't have any art books yet. He needs some. Yeah, get on that, Phil. Right. Uh, and they're on my website as well. You can get some of them there. But um, so one of the things that I learned when I was learning to do screenwriting is that you really just need to get a sense of who your character is. And so one of the things that I remember reading is they would say, write at a minimum one, but two to three full pages about any of your main characters if you're going to put them in a screenplay. And it can be from the fact that somebody has a broken home and an abusive father, or maybe their life was, you know, rainbows and everything handed to them. And later on in the real world, they couldn't adapt. And the more you write about them, the more they become sort of real for you and you feel more connected. So I think you can write them hopefully in a more natural way because that person seems like a friend or somebody that you know. And so rather than, um, you know, maybe some people just say, hey, I drew this picture and it's of, you know, Tinkerbell and isn't she pretty? And, that, and that's pretty art. That's fine. I get paid to do a lot of that. And I might not know about the characters. Um, but the more you write about them, the better you get to know them. So I would say if I'm writing about a character and you put three to five hours just in their backstory and then you start telling about where they are now, you probably have a pretty good feel for them because that's a lot of writing. If you're spending that much time, you can decide if they had a sibling and where they went to high school. And you know, if they had a certain scar on their face, where it came from and the more, the more details you give them, the more they're a real person, just like you and I, I, at the beginning of this conversation, I had no idea that you had, um, uh, that you came from a military brat background and that you had sons that are also serving. So, it's just the more time you spend with a subject and conversation, uh, the more you learn. And, and to me, I feel more connected to you now, just knowing that information. Yep. Uh, I think I've got a scratching dog over there, so don't mind the background noise. But um, <laughs> <laughs> this is live, folks. We, you know, give us a little leeway here. Um, so I've got uh, MavArts. I hope I've got the right website here that I spelled yes, that correctly. Yeah. And uh, so that is where you can find some of his artwork, more of his story, and links to his uh, books, customer testimonials. I don't think we need that, but you've got a really cool gallery 
copy here uh, of items. Where else can we? So where else can we find you? We've got you. Uh, we've got the Loco Hero uh, Facebook link. Um, are you uh, are you follow up on friend requests on Facebook? Uh, are you on Twitter? Where else can we find you? Yeah, so I just changed the Twitter handle uh, over to the same as kind of my website, so it's a little more universal. So um, I'm Mavart Monty on Twitter, and I'm kind of more of a Facebook person. I interact socially. I like the one-on-one -on -one of Facebook. And so uh, you'll find the majority of my posts there and on the various pages for um, the, the stories like Loco Hero and Blood and Bullets. I have a professional artist comics group that has over 5,000 people in it. I have a Western art group that has like 2,000 people in it. And so I try to be an advocate, an advocate for uh, other artists and I share a lot of other artists work. Um, and then on Instagram, I'm also MavArts and MavArts is short for Maverick Arts. So even if you type in Maverick Arts, it'll still go to my website. But believe it or not, I started that website close to 30 years ago <laughs> and at the time everyone said you need to have the shortest website possible it's got to be like ebay right the shortest amount of letters and so i wanted to be maverick arts because maverick is somebody who blazes their own trail and and they do their own thing they're the black sheep and so i own mav arts but it's maverick arts as well so i've been you know mav arts since like 93 94 I think that's perfect. It's uh, that's perfect because it's so easy. <laughs> right. And even if people type in Maverick Art, so it's the same on Instagram and now it's the same on on Twitter as well, Mavarts Monty and then uh, Joshua Andrews who's my studio manager. He has a Mavart Studio handle as well so that we can try to continue the outreach for uh, Loco Hero. Yeah. So uh, um, if the world wasn't shut down what would be like the next event that you would be attending? And do you think that 2020 is kind of a wash or is there an event that you plan on being at later on this year? Uh, so I've had five conventions already canceled. Uh, so normally this month, uh, well, I would have already attended uh, MegaCon if it hadn't moved, we would have had that in April. Uh, and then, um, uh, I would have been at Phoenix Comic Con at the end of this month, at the end of May, and that's moved to September. And then, of course, San Diego Comic Con, which I have not missed since 1993. Uh, I've been an exhibitor or a guest for 28 years. And um, so that one is called off. So the only show that hasn't canceled is Gen Con, and that's America's largest gaming, tabletop gaming, not video gaming, tabletop gaming, and that's in Indiana. And I think most people do expect that probably to cancel. Uh, it's in early August. So the shows that I would like to attend or that I'm already signed up for would be the New York Comic Con in October. Um, that's pretty iffy because of the Javits Center and them, you know, currently being a COVID hospital. Uh, so, you know, I'm just sort of playing everything by ear. Uh, one of my favorite conventions, uh, probably my favorite convention in the whole world, is in Lucca, Italy called Luca Comics and Games. And uh, it has 350,000 fans or more that attend. And I've been going to that show since 2006. And so uh, I went last year, I love the show. I love the crew and the volunteers and everybody who manages it and the fans. And so, uh, but again, it's a very large event with a lot of people and Italy has been very hard hit. So at the moment it's not canceled. Um, and so that's up in the air. I'd love to go if things, uh, if they hold it, um, then I will try to show my support and be there uh, if it's something that can be done safely. But uh, due to the overwhelming support of the sort of comics community and everybody being in front of their computers, believe it or not, just sales wise of books and comics and prints and everything through my website, uh, it kind of feels like I'm at conventions. Like I'm actually looking at all the support and, you know, yesterday I shipped out like 10 packages. And there was a variety of sketches and prints and, you know, all sorts of goodies from very inexpensive to some, you know, very expensive originals. So um, the pop culture community has really rallied around some of their favorite artists. And there's a number of Kickstarters on Kickstarter right now that are comics from Dan Mendoza. And I think Jamie Tyndall's launching one. You've got 
Brian Polito's Hell Witch coming up in less than a month. Um, uh, who else? Uh, just tons. And so really the comics community has said, hey, you know, as long as you haven't lost your job, there's a few people who have said, hey, I can't do it right now. And I basically have said, hey, we're going to make these products available after the Kickstarter. There's a few things that are limited, but for the most part, we're going to overprint certain things so that people who say, God, I really wish I could have gotten that honor bound variant. Guess what? It's not limited. I want to be able to raise as much money as possible with that cover for years to come. It's not even just a Kickstarter thing. That's where it was born and where we're launching it. But if I sell 200 copies next year, that money is still going to go to Operation Second Chance. So that's something that can have a real life to it. And that's why I'm not limiting that. I didn't want to make it seem like, well, I can only raise so much money for you. Here you go. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I wanted to stress with people is that you can do a fundraiser, but you need to contact the organization first. Because if you don't do that, you can get into a lot of trouble. First of all, they could come after you and then uh, and then you can be perceived as a scam. So it's really important for people to say, hey, you know, if I wanted to do a fundraiser for the Red Cross, I can't just put the Red Cross emblem on there and just say, hey, I'm doing this for them. I have to be in contact with them and get permission because a lot of that time it's uh, it's trademark or branded or th they're doing that to protect their uh, their brand mm -hmm. as far as, you know, helping out. So we have to be really careful about that. And, but it's just uh, it's one of those things. I love hearing that your uh, that cover is not going to be limited because it does give that opportunity. I mean, put that on a T-shirt, put it on a mug, you know, make posters out of it and stuff. Yep. Uh, and that could carry on for years and years as a wonderful tribute to to the veterans. And, and it uh, can also be a series. I'm, my hope is that if this is successful enough, you, you know, I'm an artist. I'm like Doritos. I can make more. Yeah. You know, well, maybe this is the first of an entire series that, you know, becomes, hey, this is part of the Honor Bound series. We're on number five. And somebody says, well, I've collected all five. And, you know, you've got my different books and things. So uh, as an artist, I'm going to try to up my game on whatever the future thing is and say, okay, well, that was successful, but how do we take that to the next level? Because, you know, what happens if an organization gets behind us next year and they say, well, we want this, but we want to, we want to donate $10,000 and buy this amount of books to give to, you know, veterans or as part of outreach or the VFW or whatever. Um, thank you, Phil, for ordering some books uh, that, uh, that that can just continue on. And so, uh, it, it kind of seems like a brave new world has kind of opened up for this character and the reception that people have given the idea. And I'm just very humbled and kind of blown away uh, because three or four weeks ago, not so many people knew about this little project, you know, that I had. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. <laughs> he likes my Doritos comment. <laughs> I am like Doritos. Crunch all you want. I'll make more. Oh, we lost your audio. Yeah, I was saying more like Doritos. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. Well, that's kind I was of listening my, my to your yeah. I was listening to your interview uh, from the other night. I think it was with uh, with Rob, where oh. the the play on your name is like more. I'm like that's that's perfect. That uh, you, you couldn't fall into a better name for that. Yeah, you you said it a number of times during the interview, and in my brain, I always think you were saying, yeah. "Well, we'd like to see more stories from him." I'm like. You got it. <laughs> With the extra O. <laughs> right, exactly. If you now, bring, well, yeah. I was going to say, if you can bring up the honor bound variant picture again, this is the first time that I've ever noticed that in my own name, in order, you can spell my last name. So if you look down at the bottom, um, where it, it, it says written by Monty Moore in the red and blue, and then my, oh, there you go, you'll see that the M O O R E. And I have never, not only did I have never written it that way, but I'd never noticed it until I was literally doing the design. And I huh. thought, oh my gosh, I wonder how many people can actually do that with their first and last name. And so that's kind of a little, a little thing that I've never done before that kind of ties in with the whole last name promotion, expect more kind of a thing. Wow, that is really cool. And, and you, you know what? I, I like I like wordplay and puns. 
<laughs> yeah, and I saw I saw the red, white, and blue, but I didn't notice more until you just pointed it out. That's so cool. It's uh, well, I don't I don't mention it too much, and not many people have caught it. I think they just see the color splash. So I like things like that that are subtle. It's kind of like hiding something in the in the artwork. Yeah, and Phil is asking, what more can we expect in the future? Um, you know, I like the I like the direction the train is going with uh, um, you know continuing to be a publisher. I, I you know I've been in the industry for almost 30 years and um, I still will want to create artwork for my favorite customers and for my fans. Uh, but uh, I really I'm enjoying the the arc that I'm on as an artist and. You know, it kind of feels like maybe where Brian Polito was 20, 30 years ago saying, hey, I've got this idea as a character and become a publisher. And so it doesn't mean I'm going to produce, you know, suddenly a lot less artwork and you're not going to see artwork from me because as an artist, making new artwork for me is like oxygen or food. Like yeah. I need to be fed. And if yeah, I don't do artwork for a while, ink. I'm like, yeah, yeah I need to draw ink in your paint. blood. <laughs> yeah, I need to draw and paint something. And I love the feeling of, uh, for example, I've got the honor bound drawing right here. And I love being yeah. able to go from a, you know, simple black and white page. You can see our little tattoo there. that says army of one. And, you know, having created that with your hand, I, I still love that feeling. And so I plan on continuing with that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm liking this sort of putting on a new hat and saying, hey, rather than just being a publisher of your own art books, now you own your own IP, if you will, your own characters. And, uh, and that's in this day and age, especially with the golden age of sort of television and content, it's pretty exciting. I got to tell you. Yeah. Even Phil saying, wow, with that, uh, with the sketch. Oh, thank you. This is a, this is the other one. This is the um, this is a drawing that I'm, I'm not planning on selling anytime soon. And this is the barely there cover. And there's a scene in the book where she's putting on her outfit for the first time. And so she's going through the donations bin and she's grabbing, you know, things that she thinks a superhero would wear. And to me, this kind of also indicates that, um, you know, she's sort of stripped down. She's bare. And then she's going out, you know, dressed up as a superhero. So this is another one of the original drawings uh, that I've done in just pencil. Uh, you can see my little logo is even hiding up there in her uh, ski goggles. So there's a little art reveal for you. That is just stunning. I, I mean, I can't draw stick figures. I'm <laughs> I always tell so people. So I admire you know. any kind of, uh, uh, well, you know, I, I I, uh, I have a musical background and I do writing and stuff like that. And I say, everybody can write, everybody can sing, everybody can draw. You just might not do it so well. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you feel that same way because I tell people that all the time and people say, no, I can't do that. You are magically gifted. And I say, you know, not everybody is going to be Mozart or Brahms or Bach or Stevie Ray Vaughan for that matter. There's people, and hopefully I have found you know, early on what my, uh, my passion was, but I think it comes to honing it. So for example, I tried to play guitar for about three years and I took lessons just like anybody else. I wasn't particularly good at it. And when my career started taking off, I said, I only have so much time in the day. And so I haven't picked up a guitar in 15 or 18 years because I chose my passion as my artwork. And so, uh, I have respect for those people who sat down and do it, but I really do think like you do, everybody can draw and play music and cook and do all these sort of things. doesn't mean you're going to be Bobby Flay, but you could be if you spent 30 years and that's all you did, you would become very good at it like anything else. So um, again, we're not going to all be Michelangelo or, you know, Da Vinci, but if you studied something and you did what I did and went to art school and then took, you know, 20 workshops and you did it 70 hours a week, you'd probably be pretty good at it. You know, you might, you'd probably be pretty good that you could make a living. Uh, yeah. That's my own personal take. Everybody has a different take on it. Some people say, no, it's magic and, or you're touched by God. And that's, 
their own thing. I personally think it's a struggle and it's learned and applied skills, but each to their own. You know, uh, that kind of speaks to saying, you know, oh, he's an overnight success. No, <laughs> no, that doesn't exist. There are years of blood, sweat and tears to go into yeah. that. It's only the overnight success because they were noticed. <laughs> yeah, I, I made a funny thing. I made a funny post this last week and, and it came up that uh, somebody had posted a, a Vampirella cover that I had done in 2000. And so I reshared it and they were, you know, they were nice drawings. I'm trying to see if I had one sitting here. Um, and from year 2000, I posted it into the pro group and I said, ah, crap. I just realized it's too late for me to be an overnight success <laughs> or a flash in the pan. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. It's like, no, uh, no, honey, the, uh, the audience didn't notice me until just now, you know, and thank you. But where yeah. were you like 10 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> or I 20 or 30 years ago? <laughs> yeah, I kind of consider myself really more of like, just kind of the journeyman illustrator who's been carving it out in the trenches with uh, games and comics and movies. So usually never over here working on the super big budget part of it. So if I worked on Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, I was probably working on games and trading cards, right? I wasn't getting to do the movie poster for it. That's the, you know, rock star limelight stuff. But there's plenty of us artists that are, you know, still making a fine living, uh, doing the backbone art that's needed for promotion and games and lots of other stuff. So I feel very fortunate that the hard work has paid off and that, I've never not had work for, I mean, really since coming out of school, I've always had either a job as a designer or an illustrator or plenty of commissions and projects lined up, usually always for two to six months in advance. But you're always marketing yourself. And that's one of the things I love about Facebook and social media is, is that uh, you're always meeting new fans and, uh, without naming names, there's a, a, a new guy that I've been interacting with who said, I, I'm new to discovering your art. I didn't know who you were before. I've spent hours on your website. I've read about you. I've done research. We're now friends on Facebook. He's starting to buy some original art. And here's, you know, I might think, how can you not, if you're into comics and games and movies, how can you maybe not have come across my art? Or maybe you did, but it was only one little thing. And so you're always making new friends and new fans who are saying, I see what you're doing and I've come to respect it. And once they have that respect for what you're doing, usually they want to support you. They either want to have some of the art or they're going to support your Kickstarter. And uh, it's very fulfilling uh, to say, hey, it's not like you're running out of fans. There's new people going, wow, I really respect the fact that you've been doing this this whole time. Mm -hmm. But and I'm actually, you know, you're not, I'm not like J. Scott Campbell or Jim Lee where they're lined up 10 deep at my table. I'm the guy who's still there at shows and people know and recognize, but I don't have lines, you know, yeah. and I'm okay with that. I'm just like, Hey, there's money. And, and I appreciate that the humbleness that you bring to it, you know, despite the, the successes that you've had, because you could have been a class A egomaniac, you know, <laughs> and, and we would have cut this interview short a long time ago, you know, yeah. but I, and, and so I appreciate that. I think a lot of people, um, you know, they, I think it may be in their head, they reach a certain level of success. And all of a sudden, it's, it's like they expect it, like, what do you mean you didn't recognize me? What do you mean you don't know who I am? And they get all offense, offended, mm -hmm. instead of like, kind of keeping it low key and saying, Hey, I, I appreciate that you finally found me, what else mm -hmm. can I show you? And yeah. kind of turning that around. And, so and, I, yeah. It's a, there's a lot of artists in the industry and I have attended, <clears throat> I added it up once and it's like 400 conventions. Um, and there are those who have reputations and you kind of go, this guy knows where he is in the food chain and just be ready to deal with it. Doesn't matter if it's guy, girl, you know. Um, and then there's the opposite which happens, which is a younger artist today will end up with some very quick success because they can reach people very fast due to social media. And so suddenly they might have a page or get all the followers and people go, oh my God, you're amazing. You're the next second coming. You're gonna be, you know, they have the, uh, 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 a career like, you know, Jim Lee or Alex Ross. And suddenly these people have been in the industry like year, year and a half, 
you know, their prices and their ego are suddenly kind of over here. And the rest of us are kind of looking and going, you better be careful because that's going to bite you in the butt because yeah. the skill level and their fan base can't necessarily support it. So if somebody has this much success and they say, well, this is just going to continue. This train's not going to stop. If your skills and your uh, interaction with people don't continue to improve, well, you might get those 30 or 40 fans who all buy some art and they go, yeah, but I already have some art from you. So I'm moving on to the new person over here or I'm buying legendary art over here from, uh, you know, some golden age artist that they want to get. And then they don't have this rock solid tier of fans that they've built up over decades to mm -hmm. support them if they need them to support a project or whatever. So um, I see people who need to be careful. Yeah, I, I call them I call them the notch in the bedpost type of people. Yeah, you know? and somebody says, and that's all you are. Them. Yeah, and and they, um, you know, you don't want to be the fast food of art. Yeah, you know, that's okay. consumable and moving on. You're like, hey, that's pretty tasty, and I moved on over here. You want to be the bedrock and kind of go, you know, what what can I do for you? Not what can you do for me? And yeah. if if people have that attitude then i think it'll serve them a lot longer uh but me and a lot of the contemporaries that i you know kind of was on the road with we only had conventions so you really had to bust butt and be humble and 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 earn the respect and i hate to say the catchphrase but paying your dues going to these conventions sort of prior to social media really elevating and saying, wow, I can, I can sell art now to fans in England and Russia and, uh, and wherever. Um, but you got to remember is you're also competing with artists in those same countries. And so what I might charge here in the U S might be an absolute fortune to a really good artist who lives in, uh, uh, uh Indonesia or the Philippines. And so, now fans can also go buy art very inexpensively from some very skilled and talented artists. So uh, that's just kind of a segue that it's a global market. So um, people shouldn't get too full of themselves. You should always be thankful of your fans. Yeah. And uh, Terry McIver has sent in a couple of messages here. It says, I think we might have answered this earlier. You mentioned a Michelle Rodriguez type for the ad adaptation of Local Hero. Who would you want to direct? Who do you think could be uh, your vision to life and do it justice? Yeah, I think we answered this a little bit earlier. Yeah, um, I dabbled a little bit with directing. There was a, a project that actually didn't get released that was called Screenplay uh, that I wrote. And um, so uh, I don't know. I, I guess I would have to look at some other things and say, here's a fantastic director. But I mean, if you, if you had carte blanche, I would go out and get somebody like uh, Ron, uh, what's his name, from uh, Opie. Oh, Ron, Howard, Ron Howard. Ron Howard. So like, if I look at some of the movies that Ron Howard has done, even early in his career, like Willow, all the way up to things like uh, um, the, the Moby Dick film, he did a race car film, he, I thought he did a fantastic job on the Han Solo movie that he had to take over from somebody else. Is a fantastic director. I don't think I've ever seen anything from him I didn't enjoy. Uh, and so I wouldn't want this story to get so taken over with the agenda driven part of it that you still want to be entertained. And I, and I think that you need to, you would have to find a balance between storytelling, characters, entertainment, and also some cultural awareness. Mm -hmm. And uh, Terry had another question, which uh, kind of feeds into what I wanted to ask you um, as far as giving the next generation advice or those who want to break into the field. He says, I'd love uh, Monty to have a chat with a friend of mine who's an artist, Jay Bauer Art. Reassure him that it's a long game rather than instant success. Hey guys, how you doing? This is Jake Estrada from Indie Originals. This year, for Indie Originals 2020, we've added another category, and that's comic books, independent comic book creators. That's right, guys, here we are. We're inside a comic book shop, and look at all these beautiful comic books. I wanna tell you, indie comics are the backbone 
of Marvel and DC because Marvel and DC cherry picks certain, certain creators and they make these guys superstars. So that's why we added comic books. But I'm a comic book guy as well. I'm the creator of Bocas, soon to be released feature film. And we also have Terrence Baker as a, a judge, along with Nino Mazzarina, who does the Unbelievable Launch of Detergent Man, along with his little comic strip that he does for the Chicago Tribune. You need to sign up. You can go to www.indieoriginals.com and sign up for the Indie Originals Combo Contest. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. Peace out. Um, as far as giving the next generation advice or those who want to break into the field, he says, I'd love uh, Monty to have a chat with a friend of mine who's an artist, Jay Bauer Art. Reassure him that it's a long game rather than instant success. Yeah. Uh, and, and people can always, you know, follow me obviously on social media and I have a lot of videos. I have an entire channel on YouTube that has about 70 videos. Uh, one of them is how to break into comics and games. Uh, that was a video that I did and my channel is called Art Attack, Monty Moore's Art Attack. And I always preach the long game. And the, the, the problem with younger artists today is due to social media and instant gratification, people I don't think want to um, hear the fact that plan on it taking 10 or 15 years um, before you maybe have sort of like that rock solid kind of either career or reputation that your skills weren't, that you never are looking for work. You have enough social media and things out there that people are always coming to you. And I even pay for some services uh, there's a website called uh, cartoonistforhire.com and I've taken several jobs from there and for 35 yeah, bucks a month right you can get leads and most of them are leads that I don't necessarily want but I've done two or three jobs um, but it's a great place for young artists to show their work and I think they have a level that's a free gallery and then they have like a lightly paid gallery where you get more um, but that just kind of comes down to the fact that I don't stop marketing myself even though I'm in more established artist, like I say, the journeyman, there's no overnight success, but um, I will tell you that this is year 28 for me. And I think that when I finally found that the reputation and the fans and everything was kind of more humming along, it was year 25. So I really feel like I'm actually only on the second half of like hopefully a 50 year career where things are moving the way I want to and it, you're not having to maybe work quite so hard and the prices that you're getting for either your work or your originals is a little more commensurate with where you feel maybe you are in the industry. And um, uh, we're, we're artists so we always compare ourselves to, at least for me, great artists all the way back to you know early as well as to modern contemporaries like uh, Frazetta or Rockwell Patrick Nagel, any of these artists are names that people know uh, and can be inspired by. And some people's art sold for millions and some people like Van Gogh sold one piece and died in basically poverty. And, and that's, that's the starving artist side of things. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, I don't think that they realize that they have to treat their artwork. If this is something that they want to do, they have to treat it like a business. More you have to like a, a plan. Yeah. yeah, you have to have a plan, you have to have goals, you have to have a budget, um, you know, and um, a roadmap of where you want to go and and plan accordingly. Because, uh, again, it like a business, I think a lot of people fail in the first few years. They either uh -huh. get frustrated and give up um, or they're in it for the wrong reasons. Maybe the motivation is there. You know, they see, uh, you know, a Kickstarter that's as successful as yours and going, holy crap, I can make all that kind of money. And, you know, they and their five Kickstarters fail each and every time. Um, well, be you know, because they're, they're trying to get to what they might think is the successful finish line before they're ready. So here I've been in the industry almost three decades. I'm launching my very first comics Kickstarter. I've literally been working on it and paying for it since 2014. So you can tell just by some of those numbers, I'm not rushing anything. And mm -hmm. I feel like the time is right to do it. But everybody wants instant gratification. So when they say, God, all my friends are going to back this. Well, if you want to have this kind of success, you, 
you need hundreds of backers or in, in Brian Polito's case, thousands. You can't get that kind of success with 30 friends and family backing it and talking about it. So it needs to resonate with the general public so that you get new backers who kind of go, wow, I've never backed Monty Moore's project. I've never had a project that had more than 100, 150 backers. So for me, this is all new territory. And one of the things I'm most excited about is all those new backers because I can already count on a lot of my friends and longtime supporters who have known me for 20, 25 years. But when I see new backer has gotten just a book on her bound or something like that, you know, I get all excited about it and like, oh man, that's like a new fan. And, you know, I, you know, I'm giddy about it because to me, that's new territory as opposed to the friends and family saying, oh, Monty, you can count on me backing it. I'll, I'll get one of those. And to me, that's a foregone conclusion. That's why I get so excited uh, because I have so many trusted friends that I know will support it and share it out there. Um, but, but again, it comes, you know, the long game part of it is, you know, I don't, I don't know, there's a million analogies, but, you know, you can't build a house without the bones or the basement or the structure. And I've been doing that for a long time, but everybody wants to, you know, wants to be up here. And uh, I hate hearing stories about somebody who says, I tried to be a full-time artist, I couldn't feed my family, or things fell apart, and now I'm back doing some other job that they hate. You're better to do this other job and say, this is supporting me, and I'm working at whatever that job is. It doesn't matter if it is, you know, minimum wage, it keeps the roof over your head, buys you new art supplies, and then start augmenting your income with commissions for fans. You're not gonna get publisher work right away. Marvel's not gonna come bang down your door. It doesn't work that way unless you're the new absolute, just amazing skills top tier because there is literally hundreds, if not several thousand great artists who are already in the industry. So you gotta yeah. remember you're competing against them and you're, you're competing against me. If you wanna do a cover and you say, hey, I want to do a cover for Zenoscope or Aspen or IDW, guess what? So do I. <laughs> and I'm also marketing myself. So, you know, people have to remember and keep in mind, hey, if I had a skill set like Monty or like Alex Ross, I bet I could probably get some of those jobs. You're probably right. Probably can. But that's, you know, the, ben the, the, the bar, the benchmark for publishing is always getting higher. Even though for social media, the bet you can show anything. A six-year-old can be an artist and somebody can buy that art. That doesn't mean they're a full-time professional. That means somebody said, hey, that's neat. I want to own that, right? But my definition of professional and somebody else might be different. I might say, to me, that's somebody who makes a full-time living at whatever that is. That doesn't mean you're any less of an artist. If somebody says, I don't want the stress of that. I don't want people telling me what to draw. And they just want to be more of the fine artist, which is draw whatever you want, and then hopefully somebody will buy it. That's the difference between a commercial artist and a fine artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, that that's for me. I I never started writing because I thought I would make money because I haven't. <laughs> yeah, but do I do it passion. because I do it for the passion. I do it because I love it, and I do it because the voices won't shut up otherwise. But yeah. um, writing's amazing. I love writing. Yeah, it is great therapy for me, and I uh, I wish I was a little bit better at um, outlining and things like that. I'm more of a pantser. Um, when it comes to your art, would you say that you kind of plan it or, or do you just kind of have this vision in your head and it translates well from your brain down to your hand? Um, I'm sort of interesting. I think that there's artists out there that can see everything in their head first. And I don't, ha I don't actually have that magical ability. So <laughs> I hate to say it, but I always kind of feel like I'm just making stuff up as I go. But I'm much more of a technician. So... Um, it's not uh, that I'm just sort of scribbling and I don't know what's going to be over here on the left. I still plan it out. And because of the artists who I was influenced by, which are more of like your illustrators, Olivia, Hajime Soriyama, Louis Royo, these are like people you would see on Heavy Metal Magazine and things like that. They're, they're into detail. So we plan all that out and then we cram all this cool stuff in there. And so... That's one of the reasons why I'm delighted at the end when I created something because I never knew what it was going to look like. 
And I have heard that there's artists out there who said, I can see it in my head and then I make it. It's kind of like you knowing what the movie is going to be like at the end. So when I start a movie, I don't know what it's going to look like at the end. So when I get to the end, I'm like, oh, that was fun. <laughs> and, and, and I can look at it and go, I can't believe I made that. And so that's why I kind of feel like I'm making it up. But I think it has to do with the foundation of drawing and painting and looking at great artists. If this closet that's behind me is full of nothing but art books. And I can remember when I was learning to airbrush when I was in high school, I had 36 books on airbrushing. And there was no YouTube, there was no demos. You could occasionally take a workshop. But yeah, I think this probably opens up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, you know, those are just, just art books, you know, and it's like all the way down. <laughs> and I have like three, you know, three, that whole closet's like that. And I have like one or two others. So to me, those are, that's how I learn. And um, uh, I love books. I love reading. I love writing. And, and so that's, that's part of my education back there. So if I want to go, to Frazetta or Jusco or any of these great artists, I can probably go grab five books from Frank Cho and go, I want to be inspired by Frank. And I've supported them along the way by buying their books. And I hope that they do the same for me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the art that I notice is, I mean, it's just very anatomically co correct. That had yeah. to take some studying, a, a lot of studying to do. I have a funny story about that. So I was about 16. I think I had just gotten my first art table for my mom. And my mom was an artist and she dabbled in fine art and jewelry and things like that. And when I was 16, I actually said, I want to be an artist for a living. So they knew I was pretty serious. And um, when I was trying to draw my D&D &D characters, they all had their faces covered with like a really bad helmet. And usually their hands were, you know, hidden or they'd have big gloves on or whatever. And I couldn't draw anatomy very well. And I still struggle with it today. I still draw bad hands and I screw up things. And I'm looking at my own hand when I'm trying to draw it. And that's why it's not magic because I still struggle. But I remember I went to her and I said, I can't draw people very well. And she said, okay, we'll fix that. So she brings me a stack of figure drawing books that she had you know, that are full of male and female nude figures. And she said, don't take this to town, you know, to school, right? Because I'm like 16. And, uh, you know, it's not something you're supposed to take to school. But they were figure drawing books. And so my love of figure drawing kind of started there and came from D&D &D and comics. So when people ask me today, what's your favorite thing to draw? I always say people. And it doesn't matter if it's a knight or a space guy or a portrait of a family member. I like to draw people. And one of the threads that you'll usually hear an artist say is people are the hardest thing to draw, especially a portrait. And so all the way back to the Renaissance, it's sort of like if you can capture a person's portrait and who they are, you could probably paint or draw anything. I mean, I think, you know, uh, a person is still harder than a car even though there's people who draw good people and artists that aren't very good at cars. But I try to draw everything so that if I did, I, speaking of which, I, I just did a cover for Jamie Tyndall's White Widow. And he said, you're the only artist I've seen who draws really good cars. Will you draw a picture of my character with a Cobra, an AC Cobra? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I love that car. And because I'm kind of a car guy. And uh, he had seen that I had samples and that I've gone to whole shows where I've shown nothing but car art. Not comics, not dragons, not pinup girls, just car art. I like Barrett Jackson, which is a big auto auction that's one of my clients. And um, so here I can, I can show diversity of that. Um, but I can also combine a love for cars and a love for a beautiful female figure. Yeah, it's one of the things, like I actually have a story. I'm not pandering my own stuff, but I have a story that I'm working on. And, uh, you know, in my search for an artist, I'm, I'm looking at people's stuff going, okay, because it's water-based. Who draws really good water? You oh, know? So like mermaids and things like that? Or? Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. And, and so tricky. I'm looking, 
yeah, exactly. And so finding somebody who can do that and and maybe translate the vision that I have and the words that I have into the image is like, I have to find somebody who can draw water really well. And how much is that going to cost me? You know, so I think it's like when you're merging a story like um, you're probably one that a lot of people don't like because you do the story and you do the art. You're like the triple threat <laughs> of entertainment. I don't think a lot of people like you. <laughs> I, I like to be, I call myself a Renaissance man because back in the day, you know, people like Da Vinci, he was an inventor. He was a sculptor. They would write, they would design things. And one of my mentors for almost 20 years was an artist named Frank Cavino. He was not a pop culture artist. He taught Italian Renaissance portraiture. And he toured around the country, much like Bob Ross did, and he did workshops, right? And for five or $600, you could spend a week with him learning the techniques of the masters from the Renaissance because it's not something they teach in school. And my first painting with him took three weeks. It took three workshops to do one copy of a master work. That's how long it takes. And one of the things that I learned from him because he was this kind of guy was to be a well-rounded artist. And Frank wrote his own books. He wrote books, on, he had several books published on art. He had one on skiing. He wrote stories, he also sculpted. And one of the things that he always said that resonated with me was, an artist should have the creative experience of doing X, whatever that X is. Even if they decide not to pursue it as their main thing. The artists back in the Renaissance, they didn't just say, I'm going to be a comic book inker. They had, they would take an apprenticeship. They would have to draw. Then later on, they earned the right to paint. Then maybe after that, they would sculpt. And it was all part of the process. You had to be well-rounded. And so even when you look on my Facebook page, I'm not one of those guys that lists all my clients. And it says, artist at Marvel, artist at Lucasfilm, artist at DC. I could do that. It's not my jam. And so mine literally just says like Renaissance man at Maverick Arts. I'm okay with that because I'm trying to do all these things. And I have had sculptures that I've turned into bronzes. I have sculptures that I might not even sculpt that other people just pay me to design. But I also, as we've said, I, I love writing and I haven't made a lot of money writing to date doesn't stop me from writing 11 screenplays just because I had, like you said, stories in your head that you wanted to come out. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We are, uh, we are approaching the two hour mark, despite the fact that we had uh, technical difficulties at the beginning. So we're, we're, uh, I could talk to you for hours, I think, because I just want to pick your brain, at, but we're not going to do that. Because I was the kid that got in trouble for class. Like no matter what, even if I got good grades, it always said talk too much in class. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, you made it really easy. I had questions written down and you answered them before I could ask them. So, I mean, what more could I ask for? Sounds like, <laughs> bam, look at that. You got the more in there. <laughs> <laughs> I need to have like a, a an O, a, a, an extra O here. <laughs> there you go. My, my drawing for the day. <laughs> right. <laughs> a little more. <laughs> right. <laughs> But uh, you know what we're going to do is because uh, I do plan on um, cleaning this up a little bit for the replay for any of you who missed the, the live stream. We're going to clean this up. We're going to have all the links. We're going to have some uh, some of his art. We're going to have um, all kinds of, of stuff that uh, in the cleaned up version. But for those who are tuning in right now, if you can just let them know where to find you. Um, but before you do that. I usually end all of the interviews with one question, and I ask this to uh, uh, almost all of my guests, is that if you could go back in time and tell your young self one thing, what would it be? I would say, uh, tell myself to actually go work on Magic the Gathering at the very beginning. <laughs> because when I was just out of art school, I, I already had painting skills and things like that. And Wizards of the Coast, which was a little known company, Magic was just out. And they had this reputation for paying like $50 for a whole painting and then you got $50 in stock. But you might not even get the $50. Like artists were going, oh man, I, I'm still waiting to get paid. These guys don't know what they're doing. 
Okay, so that later on that stock was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and there was some early artists who worked on it who like bought a house with cash. So I think that was kind of like the one train that I kind of like, I was in the station and I was like, ah, I'm not gonna get on that train, I hear it's kind of wonky. I'd have probably gone on that train a little bit earlier, but I passed. Go I back work on yourself and smack them upside the head. What were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, I did work on Magic the Gathering, but it wasn't until like 1998, 2000. And I, I still got paid well. People still love the art I did. But the, the, the train and the, and the, and the, uh, the, 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 um, the benefits of working on it early were already done and gone. Yeah. <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's probably a lesson to learn that, as I mentioned earlier on with younger artists, maybe I thought, well, you know, I, I'm going to pass on that. I want clients who are, you know, on better footing. Or maybe I thought, well, I'm a little too good for that. These guys are wonky. And I don't like the fact that it sounds like they're taking advantage of artists. But because they ended up being one of the greatest success in gaming history and created an entire category called collectible tradable card games, you know, that company sold to Hasbro for $280 million. Mm -hmm. I probably missed out on that one a little bit early, but who knew? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, where can we find you if you want to just go down the, uh, the rundown of where we yeah. can find more? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm on Instagram and my website is MavArts and that's short for Maverick Arts. You can find me there. You can find Loco Hero here on Facebook uh, as well as uh, on Kickstarter under Loco Hero. And then um, uh, you can send me a direct friend request at my full name, Monty Michael Moore. Uh, and you can also, uh, if you just want to follow the art and you don't necessarily want to interact on a daily basis, you can follow my artist page, which is Monty M. Moore, just with the initial. Uh, the personal profiles max out at 5,000, so every so often I have to call people who aren't active and ask them to follow my artist page because I try to keep my personal profile uh, for people who want to interact, ask questions, watch videos, all that sort of thing. So if you just want to watch the artwork, you're invited to just follow the artist page. Yeah, that's really cool that you leave yourself open to uh, to doing that. A lot of people don't. Yeah, I don't post uh, uh, religion, politics, things that can be divisive. I do believe everybody has every right to all the opinions they have. We don't all have to agree, but I do keep my art page, my personal profile about my art and my projects so that everybody feels welcome. Uh, and so I just try not to engage in a lot of uh, the, the more – things that can be socially divisive. Uh, and I hope that everybody supports Loco Hero because I think it's something that uh, no matter what side of the fence you might be on, uh, you might enjoy and respect what that project stands for. Mm -hmm. And uh, Phil Lockler says, um, thank you, Monty. Looking forward to more. Thank you. I appreciate it, Phil. I'm going to be on your uh, show later this week. All right. Okay. So uh, where are you next on the Loco uh, on the Loose Tour? Is that um, show? I think we're waiting for the next ones to come up. Uh, we've our, Brian uh, Wayne at Cheers to Comics has already posted his interview from last week. Uh, but a couple weeks ago, actually, even before the Kickstarter launch, Phil asked me to uh, come on uh, 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 a show and do a live event with him as well. Uh, and so I believe that's scheduled for uh, Wednesday or Thursday evening, I believe. Um, and uh, so I, I'll try to keep anything that new that comes up as far as interviews, we'll, we'll put those online so people can follow. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think it went a little bit longer than we expected. Uh, and I'm very grateful for your time and, uh, you know, just sharing your story and uh, the advice and, and everything. And I hope that we can get you back on, uh, on our other shows as well. Absolutely. Uh, anytime you guys, uh, you know, need me or want to come on or a post, campaign you know chat about how it went or if you have other questions uh just let me know and and uh, uh i think one of the things that artists should do goes back to being the renaissance man is also help the next generations of artists so that maybe you don't make some of the mistakes that we did when we were younger and that's uh, something that every um, more veteran artist should do to help out those who are uh, hoping to make a living doing it mm -hmm. 
And and on that, guys, I want to thank you so much for tuning in to Lady Geek Live. Uh, this was a special episode with Monty Michael Moore. He is the uh, creator of Loco Hero. You definitely want to tune in uh, to his Kickstarter. Watch the video. Read through his bio. Look at some of the artwork. The variant covers are just stunning. And uh, on that, we're just gonna we're gonna close out with our outro. And I'll see you in the green room. Right on. Thank you for tuning in to Lady Geek Live. This is a Geek Insider production powered by NSC Live TV. Hit the subscribe button and follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. We've also got advertising opportunities. For details, contact advertising at geekinsider.com. Once again, that's advertising at geekinsider.com.